Lots of good stuff going on here in the book of Ruth. It seems like a uh, kind of just, you know, your simple narrative, and yet uh, there's a ton and tons and tons of layers you can start uh, digging down on it. Lots of good questions. I overheard just a little bit of the end of the group in here's discussion, a great discussion. Lots of good questions. Uh, some of which I'll try to answer, but you know, if I don't get to a question, uh, by all means, uh, by all means, stop. Me. So, uh, Ruth, four chapters, lots going on. Let's get going. Why not? All right, maybe we'll get going. Maybe not. Yep, you got to plug it in if you want it to work. <laughs> okay. So you guys, uh, the point of the little talk after the group, like the point of the group is, to, in the individual study, is to make sure you got the play by play, right? You got down what happened in the chapter, you got some of the meaning, and hopefully the point of this talk is to give at least a little color commentary or to try to give some angles that, you know, are there, but maybe not immediately recognizable in uh, a group discussion. So. Uh, that's my my goal. Uh, uh, that makes me, I guess, the Troy Aikman in this arrangement to the Joe Buck. I don't know. Uh, and if you don't get that, then it's just fine. <laughs> or I'm the Romo to uh, Jim Nance. Uh, there you go. So they're on a journey, uh, and just wanted to make sure everybody understands what kind of journey this is. Uh, uh, they're in Bethlehem, which is right next to Jerusalem. Okay, uh, like six miles from Jerusalem. And uh, they're going to cross over on the other side of what's called the Dead Sea. Uh, and Moab is just this region uh, that is just beyond uh, the Dead Sea. So how far is this? Well, it depends on where they go, but maybe at most 60, 70 miles, uh, uh, something uh, along the uh, Camera operator is telling me I'm walk, wandering too far. <laughs> yes, for sure. So, uh, where Jesus, uh, Galilee is way up north here, not that far. I mean, this is a pretty small country, uh, certainly by Texas uh, standards, but it's not that far. All right. Uh, but it's what what's emphasized here, and what I what the angle that I want to try to 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 make sure you see is that. Uh, they're leaving one place to go to a, another place. Now, the, the presenting issue here is what? Famine, right? We all got that, right? There's famine over here. Uh, now, this is way more desolate than even this, and this is not exactly uh, you know, California, all right? Uh, this is uh, uh, pretty rough in terms of what we might call lush. Uh, and the interesting thing is they, they're going really uh, away from where it's lunch, right? But they're going in search of food. But the story here is the story of a journey. Uh, they're setting out on, on a journey. And, and of course, so many great stories are this way. You think about uh, all of the great stories that we love to, to tell as people. Uh, it's the story of the quest or the story of uh, the journey. So you think about like the Lord of the Rings, for instance. Uh, it's the story of uh, of a journey, and there, there's lots and lots and lots of them. Well, here, uh, the journey is a big part of the story. Uh, they're going to relocate, right? Over here, they get over here, things don't work out all that well, they die, right? They left uh, this promised land for a different land, and then, and then they're going to head back. And so, what came to my mind as I started thinking about, okay, you know, they've got the idea, there's a famine here, here to try to find food, and then they, they go back home uh, eventually to Bethlehem once things go bad uh, to, to get food uh, again. They've got, everybody's got that. But what came to my mind was the story of a, a kind of a journey of faith, and I think that's one of the things that is emphasized, maybe not explicitly, but certainly implicitly in this story of return to Bethlehem it is the story of, of setting out in faith. So so Abraham, you know, is our father of faith, and his whole thing was he had to leave his homeland, right? He had to journey uh, away 
uh, from that which was comfortable and that which was known uh, to the land that God was promising him, which was unknown and uncomfortable. And I think in that story, and I think in this story, there's something that is uh, deeply powerful about that for each one of us, because um, I think one of the things it's meant to emphasize is just that, that our life is this journey, and we are seeking after certain things. And the question is, like, when we go after something in life that we think is something good and then it, it isn't working out, what do we do? we got to keep discerning. we got to keep moving on the journey of life. That's what they ultimately do, right? Naomi doesn't say, like, well, here I am in Moab, and now my husband's dead and my sons are dead, and I'm just, just going to stay here forever, right? Like, she has to keep going. She has to figure out what is the next step. How does she live her life in accordance with God's plan? So, of course, she goes back, and we know the story of Ruth goes with her but the question is like what can we see from this concept that might help us and each of us is on a journey in our own life and undoubtedly you've gone to some moabs in your own life okay where things didn't work out um where uh, it led you to despair uh you think about what what naomi ends up saying there in chapter one you know don't don't even call me naomi anymore I have a new name. My name is uh, Bitter, right? Mara, Bitter. Um, and and so, she, so, so you sort of think about, if you're like me, you start thinking about all the stories in the Bible where somebody gets a new name. What does that mean for her? Uh, it means that she's, has, she's at this really low point in her self-understanding, right? She's, she's bitter in her life. Uh, and the good news is God is not done with her. Uh, she's right at the point of, of that she's really low in her journey. Uh, she goes back to Bethlehem. She's humiliated. You know, she's brought low. Uh, yeah, you know, everybody. She's not sure how everybody's going to think of her when she gets back. Yeah, good luck. You, he stayed and you left. Remember, you were going to go do something big and go find all the cool stuff over in Moab. We stayed. Um, so she's brought low. And the question is, uh, or the thing I guess that, that may be important to notice is that God's not quite done with her. All right, So right at the moment of her greatest despair is the moment when God's blessings begin to unfold. So uh, I wanted to sort of lay that out and sort of say, um, in your life you've been to Moab at some point. Uh, we all have. We've all made some. We've all Maybe we brought it on ourselves. Maybe it was to, due to circumstances that were out of our control. But we've all been brought to a place uh, of lowness uh, where we were humble and the question is what will we do with that all right there's this uh parable and you're going to say what does this have anything to do with what you're talking about but there's a parable in the new testament uh that you guys are familiar with it's obviously one of the most famous parables the parable of the good samaritan you remember the the story jesus tells so he tells this story of this guy who who leaves jerusalem goes to Jericho, you remember on the way he gets beat up, right? And then uh, uh, who walks by? Priest. Right? The priest walks by. What does he got? Absolutely nothing. That tells you what you can get from a priest. Right there. <laughs> uh, the Levite walks by. What does he do? Nothing. And then the good Samaritan, or the Samaritan, the foreigner, the enemy, the least expected person, uh, uh, walks by and, and what happens? Right? Helps him out, binds up his wounds. He's part of his healing. Well, when the early church read that parable, the key thing that they really, really thought deeply about was this idea of this man taking a journey. All right? And, and so uh, all, this is this universal, it's really neat, this really universal uh, allegorical interpretation of that parable that the man leaving Jerusalem and going to Jericho is every man, right? It's every single human being who, who leaves Jerusalem and goes to Jericho. And, and along the way, life beats him up a little bit. Everybody has to take a few licks in life. And 
And, and the way that they interpreted this was, you know, the, the priests went by, that's, that's the law in the Old Testament. Right? And nothing happened. Uh, and then the Levite goes by, this is the prophets in the Old Testament, nothing happens. And then the Samaritan comes, the one who's a little bit different from them, and that is Christ who comes to bind up our wounds. Okay? So the whole point of me trying to sort of emphasize this is that all of us are on a journey. And Naomi was on a journey herself. And her journey took her to a place where she was beat up. And it's no mistake that the place that she returns back to is Bethlehem. All right? Because that is the place where her wounds will be healed, the place where our Savior is born. All right? Everybody follow that interpretation of trying? Is that, I don't know if this was at all discussed in the groups. I'm trying to give, again, a different sort of angle than something that you might have already seen. Did y'all, everybody get that? Everybody got that? Did y'all talk about the journey at all? We didn't talk about the good story. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's, a, there's something to learn just from the idea that there's a, a journey here. Yeah, it still doesn't work because I still didn't. Okay, there's death and there's sadness in Moab, right? So they, they die. Uh, these three widows are in a really tough uh, position. I'm sure you guys talked a little bit about uh, the position of widows during this day. This is perhaps uh, one of the most vulnerable uh, uh, populations that there could be in this day. And now there's three of them uh, all together. And uh, they're trying to figure out, no doubt, what to do. I mean, this, this is a, a major loss that they have experienced. And so uh, the interesting thing is that bread returns to the house of bread. Uh, uh, that's what Bethlehem means, the house of bread in Hebrew. Does everybody already know that? Okay, so the name Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. All right, so there was no bread in Bethlehem. Uh, the famine, and now the famine's over. They're going back to get bread. Uh, house. So uh, think about like uh, Bethany, Mary and Martha of Bethany. That means house of wine. So this like Beth is house. This is in the notes, by the way. Uh, and the lahem or, or it, it is bread. Uh, so so they go back to the house uh, of bread. And this itself is just important to notice that this points us forward to what Jesus will later say. He preaches this really, really long sermon in John chapter 6, the bread of life sermon. Uh, and, and so going back to Bethlehem, uh, the place where the Savior will later be born, and, and Ruth herself will find that, that you know she's the ancestor uh, of Christ, right? She's the great, 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 great. You know how many, however many great uh, grandmother of Jesus, uh, but this is important that our our Savior um, is the bread of life, uh, and you'll see as you read chapter two, there's a there's another really fun and strong reference to this uh, when Boaz invites Ruth to come and eat bread and drink wine. Okay, so again, a very Eucharistic uh, prefiguration, you might say, here in the book of Ruth. All right, did everybody follow what I mean by that? Bread and wine. Anytime you read about bread and wine in the Bible, hopefully there's some clues in your head. Like, oh, this is going to point us forward to that critical moment on the last day of Jesus' life where he will transform the Passover meal. This is my butt here. Uh, in case you're wondering what that is, this is me. This is the place where Jesus was born uh, at the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And the custom is, uh, and some of you were there with me that day. I know Greg was, I know Frank was. Uh, uh, we waited in line for a very long time. I've since been back to that uh, church. Uh, I got to go there again a couple years back. But... Uh, you know, uh, if you were there with me that day, you remember them sweeping the steps? Remember that part of it? That they had to sweep the steps uh, at least 500 times. It was just their way of making sure you knew you were a dumb American and they were 
in charge. But uh, the place where Jesus is born is in Bethlehem, of course. And uh, the, the interesting thing, and you'll see this in chapter 2, so they go back to Bethlehem, um, and they go, and, and Ruth goes to work. You'll see this in chapter 2 at the field, field of this guy, Boaz. Um, and this, this field itself in Bethlehem, one of the things we discovered when we went to uh, the shepherd's field, where the shepherds were watching their flocks by night, this is the same location. Right? So, so these are the same things that are, are happening uh, in the same places. The custom is you, you bend down on the ground. There's like an altar right here that has its little thing, and then you bend down and kiss the place where Jesus was born. It still doesn't work. I just found you here. A mess here. All right, so this is what it looks like, and there's a very much younger version of me doing mass, and uh, this is what the field of Boaz looks like. This is what the countryside around Bethlehem looks like. So again, it's not the most lush place, and there are all these little caves out there, uh, and that's where the shepherds were keeping their flocks by night. They'd bring them into the <laughs> caves to try to keep them safe uh, at night. All right, so so. These events that we're reading about around Bethlehem are the same location where uh, the uh, events of our Savior's birth takes place. So there's a direct connection there. That ought to be in our mind as we read the book of Ruth, uh, the connection to Bethlehem, the connection to the place, and the connection to God's actions in that place. One of the things that I know probably came up in your group is Naomi says some strange things to Ruth, that, or at least it sounds strange to us, and I think it presents us with a really good challenge to try to understand it. So they're in Moab still, they're going back, Naomi's like, no, Ruth, no, Orpah, although I will always want to say Oprah. Uh, I'm sure you guys talked about that too, and it I can't tell you how many times I had to type this word over again because it kept auto-correcting to Oprah. Oprah Winfrey, uh, everybody's favorite uh, biblical character of biblical was, proportions. That was what her mother wanted to name her, but she misspelled it. That's right. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's a, a lecture note in there somewhere that I don't I can't that come to mind. All right, so... So Naomi says something that sounds strange to us, to, to Ruth uh, and to Orpah. She says, uh, uh, so Ruth 115 says this. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. So, you know, it's, it sounds strange to us because we're like, why is she telling her to embrace other gods? Uh, so why does she do, do this? Because we, oh, I misspelled that word right there. Uh, we knew her to be a woman of faith. Look at uh, some of the language she uses. So um, it, it's clear that, that Naomi is a, a uh, person of faith, it, it, at least to me. I mean, I don't think people who are uh, non-people non of faith use language like that. Maybe they do. I don't know. But just trying to sort of make sense of all this. So there's this part of theology called theodicy. And theodicy is sort of this uh, this this way this way of thinking that sort of tries to hold two things in front of us, two things in tension. One of them is there is a good God, and there is evil that happens in the world. There are tough things that happen in the world. And how do you how do Christians navigate that? Right. There is a good God who builds good things for us, and there are evil things that are happening. There are bad things that are happening. Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, this is sort of one of the, the questions that, that everybody asks. Um, and the only thing I can say is that sometimes God is acting in a way that I think he, he pushes so that he can pull. And I think that's one of the things that we do learn from this particular story um, and Mark 
Edson learned it because he read the whole book of Job before he read the book of Ruth uh, today on accident. But uh, he learned it. Uh, that God sometimes is all about in the business of pushing so that he can pull. And what I mean by that is that, um, as I say here, uh, sometimes we have to go through some type of pain or some type, some type of adversity in life. Uh, and that frequently, I think, in life, the uh, our adversity is really like a prelude to, to our blessing. And I do think that that is one of the lessons just from the book of Ruth that all of us should see and know uh, is that right at the moment when she feels the most low is the moment where God's amazing plan uh, goes into action. Now, this is hard for us because we don't like to think that God wants us to go through hard times. We like to have this idea of God that's more like a Joel Osteen idea of God. Um, that is like, God wants to bless you all day, every day, and he doesn't want you to go through any hardship. And I don't think that the biblical narrative helps us to conclude that. I think the biblical narrative helps us to see that part of the journey is precisely that at times we're going to have hard moments. And then the question is, what do we do in those hard moments? Do we let Christ come and bind up our wounds? Do we keep ourselves open to God's guidance and God's plan for us? It's really hard at times to say, yes, we do that. But I think that maybe just trying to zoom out, like, why would she say go back? Why, why does all of this happen? And I think that part of it, just trying to do this theodicy with you here, trying to understand why does it happen? Or, or maybe just to give a, another example real quick. Uh, why is God <clears throat> allowing a pandemic? Okay, that's a great question for everybody to, to ponder. Why is God allowing you know, our country to divide in the way it is? Why is God allowing so many people uh, to, to walk away from the faith? You know, in our country, rapidly in massive numbers. Why are, why are all these things happening? Right? We don't know. I mean, but, but maybe one of the answers that we do learn from the Bible is that God sometimes uh, allows the adversity uh, just before he brings uh, a greater blessing, okay? And that, 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 that's sort of the shape of, of uh, the cross and the resurrection. Is Paul saying in Romans 8, 28, that in all things God works for those who love him? Yes. For their perfect purpose? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I th and maybe that's part of the answer to this too, Greg, you know, is that, that in all things, even maybe in some of... Maybe, maybe God's allowing some of those things, and, and 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 I don't know that I have like you know the the the, the most uh, fine-tuned answer to that, but maybe, right? Maybe that's part of the reason uh, that that God uh, allows things to happen. C.S. Lewis has this old book he writes called The Problem of Pain. He's lost his wife; his wife died, and he's in deep sorrow and distress, and trying to figure out. Why did that happen? Um, and ultimately, he comes to something like this answer, you know, that, that God was trying to show him something, that he was supposed to learn something, that God was trying to bless him in some way. Sorry, but I actually read a daily devotional today that had nothing to do with the book of Ruth, but the summary of it was that our tests can become our testimony. I like that. Yeah, that there are a little tests and adventures along the way in life for sure. Yeah. How how would we know good if we didn't know bad? Yeah. yeah. How would we ever we would just be we would we would be shallow and icky if we didn't know that it can be bad and that it can be very good. So you have to yeah. see, you have to be you have to see both in order to know how good you have it. I think, I think there's some truth in that, too. Um, you know, I mean, if the only burger you ever ate was McDonald's, <laughs> well, <then you're> <laughs> you would, you would so just, 
Once you have a good burger, you're like, oh man, I don't really want to go check down that McDonald's burger. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Um, so, so lots of theodicy in the Bible, and that's just before I move on to this, uh, is a great question that we struggle with in the life of faith. Uh, and uh, easy answers uh, are, are usually maybe not the most helpful ones, but it's worth the struggle to sort of say, how is there at once a good God who loves me, who wills good for me, and I have to endure <coughs> some bad times? That, that's a good question to just wrestle with and pray about. All right, uh, you guys read this, some of the most beautiful words in the Bible, uh, and ultimately, uh, uh, Ruth's love for, for Naomi uh, leads to, to her conversion, really. Her, her coming to the place where she says, I love you so much that your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Uh, and wherever you die, that's where I want to die, too. Uh, she embraces uh, the one true God, uh, the God of Israel here, and leaves behind all other gods. And, and, and uh, these words are just, I mean, clearly, you know, chocked full of uh, uh, love and I think are, are some of the most uh, beautiful ones in the New Testament. So uh, Ruth, I think, uh, is going to become in some ways, and you'll see this unfold, this model uh, for all of us. Uh, she... she uh, uh, embodies so much virtue uh, as the story unfolds uh, and certainly becomes this uh, figure uh, who we would all do well uh, to pay attention to and imitate. Certainly one of the great uh, women in Holy Scripture. So I think I've said everything that I want to say. Does anybody have anything else they want to say? hope you're getting something out of this study. I hope it's enriching, you know, your understanding of uh, the scripture, understanding of uh, ultimately of God himself. So I have a question. Yeah. So um, Ruth is a Moabite. Yeah. yeah. And they all go to Moab where they receive. Does a different culture in that country or region that hates them? that has overthrown Israel, and then they go back, do the Jews accept Ruth? I mean, culturally, how does how does that work? We also, you'll read about uh, how Ruth gets accepted, um, and it works out okay for her. Uh, how things go well, for them in Moab, I'm not... Has, but by the, like, the community, like the like, culture of the day. Like, we asked about that, the... the, the when they got to Bethlehem and the people were stirred up, yeah. what exact were they mad? Were they glad? Were they like you said? Oh well, you left and now you came back. And I think that. So my understanding is that's the connotation. There's probably another way to take it, uh, but my my understanding is the connotation is that they're like, oh, you think you're coming back now? Uh, and so there's some humiliation there, and there's some. You're not us anymore. Yeah, you're you're uh, you're you're on a different team now, and, and I, that's why I think she Naomi accelerates it to the next level. Fine, call me Mara. You know, fine. I'll, I'm you know I'm deeply bitter. Uh, I'm bitter at the situation. I'm bitter at you. So she's showing her belly to them. I think I don't know that she's. I don't know that I would say it that way. I mean, maybe. Uh, some of this is interpretation, right? It doesn't spell it all out. Carrie said she's owning it. She owned it. I did it. I was, okay. Maybe. I think I think the easiest interpretation that's totally safe is just, hey, I, I've been, like, yes, I get it. I'm, I'm a piece of you know what, right? <laughs> like, I have made a lot of mistakes. Uh, my husband's dead, my sons are dead. Uh, yeah, we, we went on a journey to try to find a better life, uh, and here we are. But she thankfully returned home, you know, to, to the right place. Ultimately, uh, this is where she needed to be as part of God's plan. Uh, 
even if it was difficult. I don't know if that helps. You know what I think is interesting about Naomi? She she beat down and she's bitter. And she's like, look, don't hang around me because death and destruction. Go leave me on my own. And yet she is the one who inspires me to be such loyalty. Yep. Yeah, because clearly deep love, yeah. And even everything from me, you know. I found this painting of Ruth and Naomi too. I, I sort of really enjoyed, you know, how old Naomi looks and how young Ruth looks and just it wasn't quite that extreme, but the, the look of love, too, between the two of them. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's well said, Shri. Okay, well, let's stand and let's have a prayer. Thanks, guys, for being here tonight. I hope that you're getting a lot out of this study. I hope the groups are going good, and um, there's packets right here.